welcome to Season 2 of Into the Forge, the Lemnos podcast talking with hardware entrepreneurs about the journey, tools, and lessons that shape their startup and product. In this episode, I'll be talking with Amir Hirsch, the founder of Flybricks. If you think the intersection of Legos and drones might be cool, then you're going to love this episode. Hi, my name is Amir Hirsch. I'm the CEO of Flybricks. Amir, what is Flybricks? Tell me more. Flybricks is a Lego drone kit. You can build your own drones. We support quadcopter, hexacopter, and octocopter designs right now. Uh, and you can fly them around with a remote controller or smartphone. Are you telling me that I can take Legos and make them fly? Yes, exactly. Without throwing them. <laughs> Without throwing them with, with a control system and all. So I get like a, what's, so tell me more, is it like a bunch of uh, like motors and custom Lego pieces that allow me to make it anyway? What, what can I do with it? Well, how does it work? So it comes with uh, custom motor holders that we've made ourselves that are Lego compatible. They hold small brush motors that are 8.5 millimeter motors, kind of standard drone toy motors. Uh -huh. uh, we connectorize them so that they're easy to snap in and out uh, with multiple connections. This way you can unplug it and turn it into a quadcopter, plug in more motors, make it an octocopter. Uh, the board that we have has a 10 degree of freedom sensing, so that's an accelerometer, gyroscope, compass, and a barometer. Uh, it's processed in an ARM Cortex M4, Arduino compatible. We have a full open source uh, code for the system as well. Uh, there's an app for your smartphone where you can change the different configuration settings and make it fly a little bit more aggressively, tune the feedback to your liking, and also just to switch between the modes of quadcopter, hexacopter, or octocopter designs. And yeah, the, uh, this year we actually just released some new plastic pieces. So there's not just the, we had uh, five by one motor holders, and now mm -hmm. we have pieces that hold two motors and pieces that are on a raised angle as well. So why did you start Flybricks? Or tell me the story of Flybricks. Now I probably know a little bit more about how you got there, but from, from, uh, from the beginning, how did, you, how did you end up from zero to Flybricks? How did you get there? So the company is actually called Flying Selfie Inc. And we started the company thinking about building flying cameras. Uh, this is 2014 when we had gotten started. There was a lot of hype around drones at the time. And so I entered into the drone space kind of intrigued by the opportunity to first to make flying cameras, but secondly to explore sort of pocketable designs and industrial designs that allow a drone to fold up. Yep. Uh, and so in that process, we actually were using Lego bricks for our prototyping. We 3D printed these little connectors to hold a motor onto a Lego brick, and we were using the Legos as part of our way of exploring different industrial design options. Um, now, we realized, of course, that we were sitting on top of a pretty cool product idea once we started doing this. And just the idea that you could build different designs was cool enough as a product. So we decided that we would take that to market uh, before all of the other camera aspects were done and that basically hit the market with some success so we kept riding it now. So you started the company with a different end goal in mind. You're still you're still in the drone space but maybe the form factor of what you were building it uh, what you were building started in one direction but at some point you were you were staring at these Lego bricks and these Lego prototyping tools and said wait a minute I've got a great product here. Yeah, and it was also kind of a forcing function. So if you recall back in 2014, there was the launch of the Xano drone on Kickstarter, yeah. which was it still is the largest European Kickstarter, and of course never delivered. There was also the Lily drone, which came out in January thereafter and raised something like $35 million of pre-sales and raised $15 million in funding. And of course today they also don't exist. So we, we were in the middle of a kind of hype bubble for flying selfie drones. Mm -hmm. And with those kind of, uh, I don't want to say outright fraud, but sort of not entirely ethical campaigns we saw the oxygen in the funding market around us sort of dry up and we were left with a couple options one was to really really hammer out our R&D and try to take the technology to another partner or to bring our chassis to market basically the Legos that we had been tinkering with to turn it into a product and so we went that route and it wasn't actually a straight shot it wasn't like zero to a million overnight we actually started selling in December of 2015 with shipment in January, which is kind of ludicrous if you think of the holiday season. Right. But we, we were launching mostly two friends. We had 150 units we made. Then we spent all of 2016 making like 500 units and up until about July, just learning how to make larger batches. And we shipped those 500. And it wasn't really until September 22 of 2016 
when we had a big PR launch that we had started to spike sales. Uh, so we spent a long time actually ramping up to make sure the product was ready, to make sure our manufacturing was ready. And even this year, as we scaled up beyond, so last year we sold something like 8,000 units, and this year we've, we've already shipped close to 12. Uh, it's the kind of scale up where different things break at every point. So we learned an awful lot about just making consumer hardware in the process, stuff that is relevant to whatever product we do next. And we've also kept the same kind of R&D. So we had a lot of camera R&D left over from how we started. Uh, now we haven't had enough of a funding budget to sort of drive 10 engineers on the problem, but it has evolved and I have it with me actually to show you later uh, that we've evolved some of our camera tech and we're ready to start including that in our product as an autopilot soon. Oh, exciting. So I do have to say for the audience, uh, I was one of the original people that got one and my son got son and I got to fly it. So I do know a lot about this product. We've built uh, pretty much every configuration and flown it around. So uh, we, I, I've got a little history with this one. Um, had you worked on, you know, so there's the, there was the voyage from zero to Flyworks as we are today. Had you worked on hardware projects before this startup? Were you comfortable or was this your first time in? Give us your, a little bit of your background from a, from a hardware startup perspective. Okay. So before this startup, I worked for my co-founder, Rob. Rob Walters started a company called Integrated Plasmonics. We were developing a small spectroscopy device, uh, basically using CMOS cameras and modifying each pixel to detect individual wavelengths of light, and then using that as a chemical sensor. Uh, so that had he'd raised a bunch of money, recruited a great team, and we were building this towards the blood testing market. Okay. Uh, which we've learned was probably not the best market to target. There's a lot of uh, regulation to get to that market, and there are other markets that aren't regulatory burdened. But we learned a lot in the process of just prototyping hardware there about how much things cost, how far out you know your expectations are from reality. Uh, before that. I had also worked on uh, nuclear power plant controllers, so I built some like high-end computing systems. I was familiar with like PCBA design, uh, quality assurance, and all that stuff in the electronics. And my background is in electrical engineering. I'm not a software guy, so my background at least. So I knew what I was getting into with respect to how hard hardware is for prototyping purposes, and how, especially the nuclear reactor, how important it is to have really validated designs before you start to. S to, to make it for a product. So in your particular case, even though you hadn't built drones before, it sounds like you know you had gone from nuclear reactors to integrated plasmonics to to flybricks. And then interestingly enough, and, and maybe you can comment on it, is integrated plasmonics had this camera perspective, and obviously you were just talking about how flybricks going forward, you know, from the beginning and all the way through, the camera's an important part of it. So it seems like maybe some of that knowledge that you had gathered and, and learned about and I think you've done some other really interesting things around cameras, really came in, was at the sort of the bedrock of what you were going to do with Flybricks. Right, and, actually. And, and flying, self, or flying selfie. It's actually really interesting you bring up my previous startup uh, that I started was called uh, Zigfu, which was yeah. motion control with Microsoft Connect. We were doing computer vision on the depth data and building UIs with uh, you know hand tracking and face tracking. I thought that this company would be more about that kind of software tech but in fact, at Integrated Plasmonics, what I worked on was really these low-level camera stuff. And that's where I'm spending a lot of my time in R&D now. It's not on like these software applications at the high level. It's really about how do you make the lowest bomb, you know, optimizing for consumer, uh, which was more related to what we were doing in IPC, Integrated Plasmonics, than, uh, you know, the computer vision software that I had been doing prior. But I think that the, the, the big take home from, from both of those hardware experiences was that actually like the prototyping process and learning just how drawn out it can actually be. I guess it's an age old tale, but uh, the things that you learn over time tend to come back again, right? That knowledge, you're just like, how can I apply it in a different way? Or sometimes you reach back for something that you've worked on previously. So let's, uh, let's break this up a little bit again, because I think you're, uh, I hate that word pivot, that was me. Uh, I hate that word pivot, but um, in, in a classic sense, you started in one direction, took some of that technology and prototyping tools and created another product out of it. How did you decide first with Flying Selfie that you wanted to get into the flying drone space? I mean, what was, the, what was that moment where you knew you were going to do that? And then um, extending that forward, what was that moment when you saw like the Legos and how did you know that Flybricks was going to sort of emerge from Flying Selfie as a direction for the company for a little while? So take me through those two junctions. How did you know that this is what you wanted to do? So I think that like many you know people my age, we all grew up with RC toys and Legos and all these kind of stuff. 
And, you know, RC toys are really part of who I am in some sense. Like as a kid, I learned to solder by messing around with those kind of circuits. Uh, I was really drawn to the, the emerging drone space. I bought one of the earlier Phantoms, mm -hmm. you know, and I had been really excited by the prospect of miniaturization. I was already involved in, in the camera tech space. So I had this vision that, you know, we would be integrating really nice high-end camera tech into this tiny drone device and being able to pull it out of your pocket, take a picture, you know, and that, that idea just like really stuck to me as like a product that needed to come out. And, you know, we've watched the whole space evolve over four years and it, we can see just how far out it really is. Yeah. It's like the difference between an Apple Newton and an Apple iPhone almost in terms of like timing the technology right. Now, I do think that, you know, we're, we're slowly trending towards the space where you can get a small, cheap flying camera. But I think that the R&D budget even that Lily had wasn't sufficient to churn out a larger version of it. And so it's kind of naive to think that without $30 million, you're going to make the smallest, smartest flying camera. I remember when you came in, we when you explained this idea to us, we were in love. I think we were all in love with it immediately, but I don't think any of us necessarily understood the degree of difficulty, and including every other competitor who had the, a similar thought in a similar window, how difficult it is to make a intuitive, easy, you know, intuitive, easy to use, stable, small, inexpensive <laughs> drone, in essence forget about the hardware design, like yeah. software experience as well. I mean, you could spend $15 million just trying to get to the point where like, let's say Snapchat Spectacles, they have probably the best photo syncing interface I've experienced. That development alone, forget flying, forget, you know, an industrial design that makes it light enough and not just get destroyed every time. Just making it a camera that syncs with a phone is a hard enough problem. Now, there is some question of like, well, why not go out and raise money? And I did mention about how the environment was at the time. But there's also this thing, you know, I'm on record saying that revenue is just like fundraising. It just costs you less to get it. And making a product isn't a total waste of time, even if they don't achieve massive scale. Mm -hmm. So that brings me back to this idea that like, you know, as an engineer, you're really comfortable writing hello world and evolving that into your, into your software or hardware product. But what you're not comfortable with is starting your sales at some hello world and evolving it into a, you know, multinational distribution, retail distribution, D to C. And it's almost like, you know, on day one, if you're a consumer product, just sell pet rocks, just get your, get your feet wet in the, in the sales cycle. And Flybricks was the perfect product for that because, first of all, we could ship it the day we thought of it. We already had a flying setup working. Mm -hmm. We already had these 3D printed boom arms that were ready to go. There wasn't like this barrier to entry that was so large uh, that we needed extra funding. So we could generate revenue around that product. But also, it, has, it tickles the right nerves in your head. Like a Lego drone sounds like a good idea. And you know when you when you when you build a few of them and try it and you're actually having fun with it, you're like, okay, if my prototyping process is pretty fun, I could probably expand this out and and uh, make a product around it. Uh, I think that it makes a lot of sense early on in your company to sell what you've got and even from day one start thinking about what you're doing to generate revenue because you can't just be an R and D and funding organization forever. When you got started on this, what kind of engagement did you have with like mentors and peers and, you know, everyone's talking about, you know, you got, when you have a startup, you got to have these four advisors and these mentors and, and an incubator or a VC with you and all that. From your perspective, what did you have around you and sort of what worked and what, what didn't? So before this company started, I was basically A-B testing my future career by having conversations with people. Actually, like my fraternity mailing list, I sent four different startup ideas. One of them was like computer vision FPGA for B2B sales to make a better development environment. The other one was... Uh, an online social network that you can meet up with friends for lunch, kind of like down to lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I've written full business proposals for all of these, like pretty well thought through. And Flying Selfie was one, of course. And universally, Flying Selfie felt like the right thing with other people. So it's important to ask just your colleagues and friends uh, what you're doing, but you can also like, you know, go to a cocktail party and make up a job for a day, come up with what your next job will be and see if it sticks with you, you right. know? And I felt very confident that I could tell people what I was working on was like drones, you know, like right. that, that jives with my personality. It jives with where I want to, uh, learn more technically, you know, I wanted to be involved in the space. And also I really wanted to do consumer stuff. So it was pretty clear that the, the FPGA's computer vision thing, while it might have economic B2B 
stuff. It wasn't kind of like the lunch pairing or consumer products like a flying selfie would be. So talking with a lot of people early on, especially you and Jeremy too, uh, really helped me figure out what the right thing to do at the right timing was. Uh, I think the other the other angle here is that it really helps to talk to investors about what they're seeing going on. So it wasn't just my friends who were saying, oh, that sounds like a sensible idea, because investors really know what's coming on the edge of technology. And, and so you can figure out what things you might be able to get traction with in the community, uh, the broader community of investors that will really help you get leverage early on if you're doing something that jives with what a lot of people think should be around. And of course, based on the number of flying selfie cameras that came in 2014, 2015 timeline, you know, we were kind of like right in the right zone in terms of thinking about the right problems at the right time. The uh, conclusion that the market has come to, though, is that no one but DJI is correct. And that's a really interesting outcome, but it still leaves this window that if we can survive for a long enough time, you know, there's still this opportunity to, to expand the, the drone space. Yeah, and an, an interesting thing that you talk about that, like the, the emergence of DJI in that window, but sitting underneath it, it I, I think really underneath it is almost the toy category where there are Hubson and, and countless others. And then interestingly enough, uh, something you, you and I haven't even talked about a tremendous amount is the whole racing drone segment that opened up with FPV and esports and things like that so it's interesting uh, i think we all thought years ago that this the, the idea of a flying camera would be the, almost the first thing out and just absorb all the oxygen it turns out to be the almost the hardest segment and other segments have emerged and players like dgi and others have come in but the original premise that i think so many people strove for is, is still a, an open ocean to be uh, to be sailed by some some companies over time yeah and it's it's a combination of of uh you know, not understanding exactly how far off certain technologies are from market and also just an understanding of what you can do with an R&D budget that isn't already being done in Qualcomm or Intel, for example. So a lot of the existing flying camera market is dependent on Qualcomm or Ambarella for chips. Yeah. And it's almost like, well, that is the bottleneck to innovation there and you can't outinvest what they're going to do for the next gen stuff. So it's pointless to, to start making like multi-camera modules was something we were really interested in. Yeah. And then the iPhone 7 Plus has it and, you're, and, and every Android in the market will follow. And they've all invested probably close to $200 million in making that a reality. Startup isn't about to achieve that. So it is important to not just have friends who say, oh, yeah, this is the technology space, but also investors who can sort of pare down what's sane. Uh, but yeah, you're right about that hype cycle thing, DJI really running away with the market because when we started, 3D Robotics was in the lead. I remember uh, really early on, even before flying selfie a little bit, you had the Phantom, I think. Didn't your Phantom end up in the bay? Was your Phantom the one that ended up in the bay? Yeah. <laughs> you one, had one, one of flight hours, though. One of my two. <laughs> one of my two Phantoms. I was filming something on the water for a friend and uh, they'd lost GPS lock or something and flew off. But, you know, th that's actually an interesting thing that kind of uh, made me realize that I don't really want to make investments in drones anymore <laughs> like these extensive drones that crash into the water oh my god uh, but you but were you were flying them early so all the time yeah. all the time it was really fun actually i think the um you know the, the downside of being so immersed in drones is like now i fly a drone like every 10 minutes practically it's no longer like you know okay i guess it's a little exciting but it does you know it, it's like it, driving a car at some point it's your job <laughs> your passion right uh, what are the most important tools that you use to, you know, to build your company and your product? And, and a tool could be anything from a process to an actual, you know, device to a way of thinking. You know, what what are the key things that you found over this journey that have really helped you be successful? So the most important thing I think we've figured out how to do prototyping. Um, there are a number of different services that we can get boards made at different timelines. There are fast turn things in the city that will give us a board in three days. There's vendors that we can get things from a week or 21 days and it's different price points. Now, for some things, yeah, it's fine to just put out an order and then wait three weeks and continue work. So learning how to sort of balance your time. You know, if something's super high priority, you can get it turned really quickly and finish it and then the other stuff will come a little bit later. Mm -hmm. So uh, learning the different vendors, that, that's kind of like a thing you don't know when you get started. Uh, there's also that for 3D printing. So we have our own 3D printers, but when we need higher quality, we can go to a place like Fictive. Um, the uh, fact is that we've also learned how to do business with China. And I think mm -hmm. that that's, I mean, in, in that sort of sense, it's like a tool, but 
uh, understanding the way you get uh, stuff out of China. So when you started this, and let me you know step back as far as you need to, but everybody at some point goes, wow, like I buy a couple of parts off a of DigiKey or something and it costs X, but I've heard about this Alibaba or Taobao or something, and all of a sudden you go and you look and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, wait, pricing is different, but the MOQ or minimum order quantities are different. So talk to me, did you go through that same sort of exploration and how did you get, how did you learn about sort of interacting with, with the, with the Chinese sort of supply ecosystem? So one of the big sort of missing products there is actually credit accounts. So early on, you know, it makes sense to work with DigiKey and uh, U.S. domestic uh, PCBA who can give you net 30 on your on your payments because right. then you can actually make things, sell them, and then pay your suppliers. With China, it's almost always the case that you're making a deposit, probably 50%. Sometimes you can get a 30% deposit, and then you pay when the day they ship it, you pay the day before the, the remainder. There's no net 30 accounts in that situation. Right. And so you're basically either producing it on credit given to you by your bank or your credit cards or however you can get revenue in the door to, to turn back to China. So early on in your business, when, when the inventory risk is really expensive and you need cash flow, Credit really is what you do. You, you do it in the U.S., you get to leverage credit. Once you start scaling up, you have to figure out how to get these kind of credit lines, like from we use Cabbage. Okay. Uh, we also have a factor for our invoices, so we can get advances on invoices. And that basically lets us turn around uh, the cash we need back into a supply chain, uh, and that helps you to work with Chinese vendors. Now, I think that the, the other thing you learn is the way you have expectation setting. Very often... Uh, you know, the the, uh, the vendors want to please you, but you have to make sure you understand what reasonable expectations are for uh, production and delivery and like all the things that can go wrong, will go wrong. It's kind of like, you know, the, the law of, uh, of production for sure. Right. And so, you know, all of a sudden you're missing a few thousand components and it's like, okay, maybe these are like one cent resistors, but they hold up the show. And the only ones you can get, you know, are from some random vendor on Alibaba, you know? Right. So a lot of supply chain hiccups at scale up, uh, that'll happen, especially as you move to China and certain things may not be communicated as clearly about shortages and, you know, some understanding that you still need to ship stuff there, like the air freight gets more expensive. I would say the other big thing I've, I've kind of gleaned from this is like, you know, there's a difference in, in labor costs that's quite substantial. And I don't think that the U.S. really wants or should be trying to recover these manufacturing sector jobs lost to China because the capital investments have already been made there and we're never going to regain that efficiency through, uh, through I don't know, tax incentives or whatever processes we create. Like, they have a fundamentally different economy that's actually been steered to taking over that section of the global economy. And so it's, it's an interesting just casual observation, but I think that, you know, to a large degree, uh, American manufacturing will do very well to maintain the things like credit lines, fluid uh, relationships in the U.S. are going to work a lot better that way. Yeah, I um, I thought it was interesting. You, you said, uh, you know, at some point, in essence, you hear the story of, of founders and they'll say, look, I, I at some point in my, in my life cycle, I maxed every personal credit card I had. And you're like, oh, that's got to be like an urban legend. No, it's it's not. Um, when you need, as as you just explained, you know, a lot of times when you're getting going, or or a, a more traditional bank won't give you credit yet, you still need to, in essence, pay forward against your inventory. Where you 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 know you're a, you could be months away from recouping all the revenue from that part, from those orders, and so uh, yeah, so it, you know. You're living proof. It, you know, it is not an urban uh, urban legend or myth at all. Oh, yeah. I'm currently maxed out of my credit cards to make stuff for this Christmas. But also, uh, you know, this is an interesting discussion. We have uh, asked all of our angel investors and they help us with that as well. Now, institutional investors, not necessarily in the same position, but it is an argument for especially companies that will need to leverage debt to take on angels who can afford to get you over the humps. Now, there, it's actually saved our ass last year too. Uh, you may remember we had PayPal uh, freeze our account because our sales spike was so large. Now after this PR launch, we had you know generated one hundred eighty thousand dollars in PayPal sales in a couple days, and they froze our account, which was the money we needed to actually 
turn wow. over the units. Right. So, you know, the next day I had uh, one of our angel investors credit card on DigiKey, you know, getting ready to buy the components so that we could fulfill the units and then we would get that 180 back from PayPal after we proved that we shipped it. Right. So, by the way, that's an unexpected thing. That was not a positive surprise. It left me with a very angering feeling towards PayPal, actually. And I don't think that, you know, I don't, I don't think that that's something that should surprise you. But, you know, if you're a hardware startup founder or, and you're planning to do a launch campaign, be wary of PayPal freezing your account. Right, right. So you mentioned that, and I was, that was actually going to be my next question. What was the things that have happened over the course of the last couple of years that surprised you most? Like just, I had, you had no idea it was coming and uh, you had to react to it. Yeah, so the, the PayPal thing is a great example. Like having these cash flow crises happen and uh, basically scrambling and getting the money you need to do production, uh, that was a surprise that was not a very positive experience, but actually navigating it was a good growth experience. And actually, the fact that I can reflect on it later is a, you know, there's wisdom gained there uh, to tell other founders that like stand by for, uh, you know, angel investor credit, <laughs> uh, have, have that built into your assumptions, especially in things like hardware. Right. Um, the, the other sort of surprise was just how well received the product was by market. Um, so, I mean, I'd never had a product that on launch did, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a day kind of, of thing. And I think that the effectiveness of our launch campaign was a big surprise. So we hired Wareness to do PR for us. They're mm -hmm. a great firm. Uh, so for those who don't know, maybe you can give people just a two second on what Wareness does and why you, maybe why you selected them. So, so Wareness is a, uh, or VSC Wareness is a, is a group inside of a larger consulting firm that does PR for startups. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a pretty good ed tech practice, which is why we chose them. They had worked with Osmo before and a couple other Lemno startups, so we were already in the know with them. Uh, they did all the outreach to getting the press. So if you Google Flybricks, you'll see September 22 news is pretty much the bulk of the results because they put us in front of all of these different media outlets and helped us maintain an embargoed launch uh, so that we could get this huge spike on, on launch day. Uh, so they did a great job and I was pretty surprised at how effective PR was. We had actually planned uh, to have a ton of ad spending, online ads to boost sales as well. And we were so saturated from just the PR alone that we didn't spend anything on, on ads last Christmas. Uh, wow, so, that's, that's, I mean, that's powerful. That's, that's, again, that's capital you don't have to spend right away. It's partially, yeah, it's partially because the PR was so successful, but also because our free cash flow was locked up by PayPal. So, you know, if we had ambitiously created another 2,000 units, tried to sell like 20% more, uh, maybe ads would have been necessary to, uh, to augment our sales. So actually, that, that's the third lesson is, is this cash flow management thing where like, you know, you, you need to be very attentive to the fact that, you know, the hardware startup, everyone likes to joke, oh, yeah, we'll lose money on each unit and make it up in volume. You need to be very attentive to your margins as you're doing production and understand uh, that your, your activity is profitable so that you can really run away with it. Uh, I think that there are a few examples of it not working that you know are pretty good uh, cautionary tales. Now you guys had recently had a big announcement about a retail distribution partner. Um, maybe you could tell me about that. But also, since you were just talking about like cash flow management, what happens when like a big retailer decides they want to carry your product? I mean, what goes through your mind, and how do you handle it for you know still being a small startup? Right. So we just launched it to Target like two weeks ago or three weeks ago. It's in every Target store nationwide. Huge. Uh, 1,800 stores. Uh, we had to do a load-in order of uh, 6,000 units. Um, now, so that means each, each store had an allocate, basically got a certain number of units. Yeah, every, every store got three units. So they have yeah. a distribution center, and they're going to stock up some more for Christmas too. Yeah. There's two things we learned. One is that, you know, it is actually dangerous to concentrate your risk um but you know you're not a startup founder if you haven't maxed out your credit cards so <laughs> as far as risk uh, adversity goes i stare into the void regularly uh so right after your credit cards got a, maybe a little bit better at the end of last year at some point target calls and says they want a bunch and you're like all right you're using cabbage and all these different things but you're still uh Still riding, still riding the consumer uh, consumer leverage debt right now. Yeah, there, there's definitely this moment where you realize, well, I have uh, 
you know, more debt than I've ever had in my life. And that will continue being the story as long as I grow this way. Uh, and, you know, the, the scary thing about it is that, you know, Target's a really big vendor. And it, it kind mm-hmm. of means you don't know where they're going. Like, it's a little bit unpredictable. It's not like someone where you have a personal relationship who's like your mom and pop shops. Um, and because of that, the risk is even higher, I would say. Like, they, 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 can, be, they can be cold and heartless if they right. wanted to. So it really does matter that your product is ready. And you really had to craft a relationship with a buyer, somebody inside of Target who said, you know, I, I, want to take a, I want to take a risk on this. I think it's going to sell really well on the shelves. And, and you convince them of that and go through that relationship building, I would, I would guess. Yeah, we hired a consulting group called the Bluebird Group. They okay. are a uh, group in Minnesota right next to Target headquarters. They are all former buyers in the Target t- toys side. So they know what the other end of our negotiation looks like. And they guided us into the store. Uh, there's a weird personal connection that Holly knows, the founder of Bluebird as well. Oh, so that's good. We, we, we met them so co- Holly coincidentally. Another, Holly is another, mem- another member of your team? Yeah, Holly and Rob and I are the three co-founders. There you so go. that was coincidental. We had arranged to meet with the Bluebird group at Toy Fair last January anyway, and it turns out she knew the founder, who actually wasn't there anyway, but just a weird coincidental, because she's also from Minnesota. But yeah, so it, it does help to have an agent to sell in. There's a lot of different knobs to turn there. It's not as trivial as just like you know agreeing on a number and getting stuff uh things like you know the timeline and delivery schedules they they will take deductions for missing things like that um we've already had one issue with our electronic data interchange vendor not getting the order for a truck in time and it must have been target system for ordering trucks was down so we ended up sucking up the logistics cost and shipping it and we're negotiating mm. that out like that also ends up delaying the time you can invoice them because if Target picks it up, you can invoice the day they receive it, but instead you ship it so you wait till they received it. Cash flow gets shifted. The factored money can't come in soon enough, you know, when you take the invoice and get credit on it. And then, of course, they also pay later, so everything is a little bit, okay, there goes my production pipeline. Maybe we're not going to make $27,000. we will make 18000 So, you know, that that's the thing about big vendor you know you you plan your whole cash flow around it and little bumps end up screwing a lot of things up now obviously you know this is the difference between being successful and wildly successful or maybe wildly successful and completely outrageously successful <laughs> so there, there is also this question of like you know how do you manage speculative inventory how do we produ- knowing that we have this big vendor ordering stuff there's some temptation to like spend all of the gross margins we make on additional inventory, but maybe we wouldn't move it and we'd be sitting on that inventory. So that really freezes up your cash flow pretty badly if you overproduce as well. Right. Um, kind of a, another downside of that is you, to get the chip pricing, you have to order in big volumes. So you set up these orders ahead of time to get the pricing you want, uh, but then you might be sitting on surplus, which is a whole other business model, yeah. selling that surplus off. So we've talked a lot about the risks, but I, I, maybe uh, maybe I can have you highlight a couple other things. From from your perspective, what's the hardest part about being like this a hardware startup founder? And that that could be the business side, it could be you know, emotional wear and tear, it could be anything. What do you what, what's been the hardest thing for you over these years as you built this business? So, I would say you know it's kind of funny to draw it back to this, but it's the laws of physics. Physical product actually requires like work like jewels of work to get done unlike software processes where there might be a micro joule per sale of actual electricity consumed you know so in this business you actually have to make something you actually have to have physics uh, apply here so you know air freight all these other stuff that you have to account for uh that you know in the software world they're not there and what it essentially means is you have to reframe what you think about funding because like I was saying, revenue is just like funding. Well, in this sense, you can leverage credit to profit. It's not possible to do that in a software company. Like in a software as a service company, you leverage investment to a network effect. That's mm-hmm. usually the outcome. So you require investment because your sales don't meet the, the revenue that you need to actually fund those sales. It's the recurring, it's the one year from now thing that you're concerned about. So you're almost always leveraging additional uh, venture to get there. In hardware, especially consumer, you're actually cash flow limited by how much credit you can get to make inventory and then move that through a sales pipeline. So it's it's kind of this acknowledgement that you're going to be in debt 
You know, mm-hmm. like the, the the only sane way to grow your business is to not just go to every venture backer, uh, a venture capitalist out there to give you backing because you'll dilute your equity away when one credit card swipe and all of a sudden you're double your cash or whatever, what your, your margins may be. I mean, they always talk about the, the golden ratio, this ratio of like bomb or landed cost to what you're selling for the product because, you know, the difference between in essence what it costs you and what you make is your forward ability to both buy more product and to grow the business in essence, or at least, you know, protect the business. Right, right. And and that's, that's the thing where combine that with the what if I produce too much concern, right. and you're in this scenario where you're like, I'm looking at certain bankruptcy if I don't sell at least this much of it, and then I want to move most of that inventory. So you have to you have to temper your ambition with uh, rational optimism, uh, which startup founders just suck at that notoriously. Like I know that, you know, you have you have to consciously draw back your ambition for the goal because you will knock out your ability to get there if you crash. Uh, I, I've often heard it said that, you know, the, the push towards introducing the product feels like the most difficult thing you'll ever do. But after you're shipping product, this, this process of what is known as demand planning, right? This idea of how many units do people want? How much do I make? which is a, a little bit of science and a little bit of black art and a little bit of luck, it can, you know, it can sink a company. A wild, a company with a successful product can still get caught in these swings. Um, I, I was reading a great example yesterday. Snap evidently is sitting on a, a, a tremendous, let's just say a tremendous amount of spectacles inventory. But if you look at that thing, it was, it was, hot. It, was it was on fire. It was in fuego in its limited sort of constrained initial release and all of a sudden at some point somebody inside the building said well gosh people love this thing let's make a lot of them and maybe demand cools off and you don't understand exactly why and you wake up even as a successful company with plenty of money to do the planning quote unquote you end up with a lot of inventory that you have to figure out what you want to do with and if they were a startup they would not be alive anymore they would have to be a fire sale possibly to snapchat so (laughs) you know there there is that aspect to it which is i'm saying it's the physics of it but it's because these are real things that they have costs associated with existing you know it's not just software which replicates itself but uh, you're trying i mean it's the difficulty of building a product but then at the same time you have to get into the irrational and sort of crazy mind of your consumer and try to figure out how much they want, what channels they want it from and get it to them. And if the the person who's taking the risk is in essence you, right? And you know, you can be under and people are like, I want more product. And if you go over and you overbuild, you're almost at worst case because you have a boat anchor around the business, which is this, this drag of inventory, which has locked up a bunch of your capital. Yeah, you can't fly too close to the sun or you're, you're going to melt your wings kind of thing. And so it's like you have to kind of accept, well, maybe you're only making $200,000 because the attempt to make a million will leave you six hundred k in debt if you fail. And so a lot of companies err on going, trying to hit the ball out of the park, maybe to please venture capital or whatever it is. But uh, as you said, it's really easy to fly too close to the sun. And, it, and it's, you know, it's harder almost to be conservative and maybe leave a little on the table but protect the business. Yeah, and you're right to say that, uh, you know, there's often a venture capitalist on the other end saying, if you're not growing 10X, it's just not interesting to me. Uh, But as the founder, you need to sort of take that in, you know, and weigh your options against that because, you know, the expected value uh, needs to be in your favor in that negotiation, not in your venture capitalist favor, because you're the operator. But actually, even if you have enough capital to make these risks without yourself forcing yourself into bankruptcy, it's your company that will end. So even a marginally successful product, if you value your free lifestyle, you know, keep riding it because the truth of the matter is your VC, they may not know it, but you existing longer actually is the benefit, not just growing faster. Exactly. No, I couldn't agree more, even though I didn't, you know, there, there will be VCs who, who might not agree with that. I oh, guess. they would say grow fast as you can. Yeah. If you can't keep up with the other unicorn, then you're out of the business. Yeah. But the truth is that you're, 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 you are not taking as many bets as they are. You're the founder. Right, right. And so you have to make sure that you have some sense that, okay, well, this may not be my VC's biggest success, but the outcome here will actually transform my life in such a way that all future endeavors that I engage in will automatically get funding. The VC's company doesn't die in essence, right? Their investment in it dies. Your company dies. 
guy. So it's really your decision. You have to be prudent and take care of your business. Well, that's the thing. Their investment doesn't die. It just doesn't mature faster uh, as, as the fair. fastest in their pack. Yes. And so the, the, the answer is we aren't your best outcome, but we are a super median outcome, which is an outlier in and of itself because the median outcome is poverty for an entrepreneur, whereas the median outcome from an investor is 2% of the fund. <laughs> but knowing that your investor is 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 okay with that as as a strategy is not you know something it's maybe a little hard to discover early on but important to know especially if you think that's the way the business could grow so and I absolutely think that hardware investors especially will understand this they'll comprehend the binary outcome scenario a lot better than the software investors who do see a bigger distribution the binary outcome is such that just hanging on for your life means you're already doing pretty well. So what advice would you give? You're a, there's a founder out there who's listening to this who's going, man, I'm, I, I think I'm committed. I, I'm going to jump off the cliff and I've got a great thing. What advice would you give them after, after these years of growing your business? So I, I'd go back to the uh, thing I was saying about revenue is better than fundraising and just selling products. And the idea that on day one of your company actually started Hello World of Sales. It, it might feel unnatural that you're some technologist who's about to start a company who's really excited about some technology field and wants to dive right into R&D, but talking to customers very early on, figuring out what will get money in the door, that can actually fund your company too, like it, not just going out doing prototypes and talking to investors, but rather going out, talking to customers, doing contracting for them essentially while you right. get towards your product and then you know getting a repeatable sales cycle like a repeatable sales cycle is worth a lot more i think than uh, any technology you can create because it will it will keep your doors open i think one of the things that kickstarter and, and indiegogo and others did maybe well in, in hindsight when we look back years from now is is that they did create these relationships you could interact with a group of people express that you have this product idea Unfortunately, maybe you had to take too much money from them early on when maybe you didn't have quite enough feed on the product, but you could enter that dialogue more quickly. The funny thing is, is if you know how to do it, you can create that dialogue even before you really have product or when you have very proto without using Kickstarter or Indiegogo, but it's the relationship that homes the product in. And I think I couldn't agree with you more how important that relationship is. Yeah, and talking to your customers will also reveal a lot of the holes in your thinking. You know, a lot of times the founders have some thing that they really care about. I mean, I know what it is in my product. I'm not going to tell you, but, you know, there, there are elements in our product that like Rob definitely put there and I definitely put there. And if you talk to your customers, you'll know they don't really need to be there. And you're actually, you know, that $1 component is just going to waste $20,000 over the next year because you're the only person who cares about it, right. that feature. And so actually talking to customers is this cycle of feedback that you want to get started early. Now also, I would, I would actually say this too, you can be in an adjacent business model, like you have a dishwasher robot and I'm sure that those founders went around and actually washed dishes for a while to like explore a little bit. And that's similar to their sales, although well, no, I know, yeah. I know them well, so I'm just saying, like you're not building your business's value by like scrubbing the dishes. You're building right. your business value by starting a conversation with the people yeah. who have to hire those people and figuring out a little bit about what your sales cycle is going to look like. And so it makes sense to just do some of that kind of work early on. It also builds character. Why did you choose to work with Lemnos? So Jeremy's one of my best friends. Yeah. I've known him since MIT. I think we met the very first day we both got there, even before we got there. Uh, I thought I also was housed in Lemnos for my previous startup. So in 2011, when you guys were at Luxem Street, I was sharing the office space before you even had enough companies to fill it. Uh, I think you were there. You were there before I was there. I was at Lemnos yes. before you were. Eric. You, That's you, right. you, you are you are earlier than, than even I. So. The, the, ori the original the Lemnos original. fanboy right here. <laughs> I wanted to go through the program. I also had done Y Combinator in the past too. Uh, and I kind of wanted to be part of this community and be, uh, you know, able to see a lot of innovative technology happen uh, up close, which I think is probably Lemnos' strong suit, is actually being able to pick founders who will make real technology. Even as I preach, like, the hello world of sales, sell your pet rocks, I'm really impressed with the technical skill in this building. Mm -hmm. And I would say that for anyone who is a serious uh, electrical engineer, mechanical engineer interested in hardware, that Lemnos is like the, the best place to go. I think the interesting thing with you is that now you're sort of the person that if someone has a you know question on computer vision or X or Y or Z, they're like, we got to get a hold of a mirror. <laughs> so it, 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 as time goes by, everyone, you know, everyone's specialties and what they know becomes an asset to other people. 
Definitely. Actually, that's the most exciting part was from the time that I started Lemnos to now is observing the emerging network effect. So I was in Y Combinator. They already had a network effect. Yeah. But watching it happen, that's got to be the coolest thing. Because you guys, like, you know that's what you're building. And so when you see it sort of happen on the mailing lists and you start to see, well, these founders are helping each other, what ends up happening is that every investment you make then starts to be a contribution to that network value. And and I've decided that this is true for most incubators, where if, once you have that, you could give them money just to be in your program if they're the right people, because they'll add value to every other startup. And in fact, my previous startup, the YC company, when Zigfu failed, my co-founders went to work for another YC company. So you can almost treat it like this like recruitment cost, in a sense, to bring people in the network. Oh, I mean, I can be you know very open about it. I, I mean, I, I too have you know access to the to the YC list, and those lists are powerful, right? Because it's a it's a combined network effect, and, and to your point, YCs is a strong network. Yeah. When we started, I think we were. I think between you know you, me, and five other people, we were the mailing list. <laughs> and now at you know forty seven companies or something, and hundreds of people on those lists, all of a sudden, I, I love it now because someone will ask a question about just you know, hey, how, what payroll vendor do you need or Hey, I need a quick turn board done here, and then you know you get five answers back in five minutes, and that's again that network effect. And as a as a hardware founder, I mean, no matter how you get to network, you you know I would say no matter where you go, find a network, find a tribe to work with, because again, you can't know everything, you can't put everything in your head, but someone else already knows that answer. It's fresh to them. They have the most current information. It may be, hey, that PCB vendor was great a year ago, but, you know, man, the quality has really dropped or their, their lead time or, you know, whatever it is. You want current information. And so to do that, you just, you know, the, the, the tribe that does a pretty good job. Yeah, it's also good to be in a community of people that you think are impressive and like yeah. know, you know, like I fantasize about working for half the other companies in Lemnos. Like I want to do radio on the FPGA radio thing those guys are doing, which oh, is just, yeah. you know, Mew Mimo stuff. Like I, I've been thinking about these ideas forever and they're doing a startup. That's so cool. And actually it's been a long enough time watching Lemnos go that I can almost predict what the startups are going to be like Noah's startup built. Yeah. Oh yeah, I knew Lemnos would back that. You know, that, that sounds like something that, that Jeremy's been talking about for 10 years, frankly. But like, you know, there, there's a community where, where you're going to start to see things that you're really excited about happening too. Yeah, you're which, talking about Noah from Built Robotics, which is on episode one. Oh, so. uh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I just find it like, it, it's very inspiring to be around other companies you want to you wanna work for kind of thing. Frankly, the other angle on it is that being in a community motivates you to outdo each other. Like, yeah. You know, you see this person, that person doing things. Now, to some degree, people feel like they have to outdo each other on fundraising. And I have a much more um, sanguine approach to this. Every time I see someone has raised a lot of money, I am very scared for their future because I know that that's a liability. That unless they have sales in excess of that number, those founders are setting their milestones so far out that it might be unattainable. Right. And so, you know, it is true that we all brag about our outcomes with investors here, but also that is a whole other I mean I, I think it's, it's an interesting credit to you in essence you may have raised less than maybe most of the Lemnos companies but you have a higher ARR or annual reoccurring revenue than many of them who are still working on products right you with a revenue focus you're able to get to that metric both customer relationships number of customers and revenue which is the end goal that everyone you know is, is striving for but you got there you know both through a lot of hard work and, and faster in some ways than even venture could unlock different kinds of revenue. Yeah, I would say that our vanity metric is definitely like our ratio of revenue to funds raised, which is now yeah. greater than one. And of course, the new vanity metric is going to be our income tax, which is kind of a what startup pays income tax. But the answer is that, you know, until we get back on that venture cycle, if we want to do something very ambitious with our product, we're going to grow in this sort of natural way where we reinvest revenue and credit lines back into profit. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's a good way to generate uh, personal wealth, maybe not investment returns in some long term fashion. But the truth is that, you know, personal wealth is the first step to investment returns. Mm -hmm. And in almost every case where you can do the next ambitious product, having something under your cuff really helps. No, again, I, I laud you for the, what you've done. Last question, it's a fun question. In those fleeting moments when you are not working on Flybricks, are you reading books, favorite band, gadgets you're carrying? What sort of, uh, keep, what gives you energy outside of Flybricks? So I'm a total nerd. I only read 
nonfiction biographies or technical journals. Okay. And right now, absolutely obsessed with reading every technical journal I can read on through Silicon via technology. So I'm very interested in 3D integrated chips and where that's going. It relates back to research I did in college, mm -hmm. but also because you know I'm starting to think where I go with computer vision, and I think that there will be uh, processing power integrated with a camera to do smart camera applications. It really goes back to where we wanted to go with flying selfie about right. integrating a lot of this stuff, even at the silicon level, to make the lightest weight, smartest possible stuff. And it's happening everywhere in the market kind of thing. There's like 10 different companies working on neural network classifiers and a chip that might be bound to a CMOS camera. I think that the through Silicon Via Tech is really going to be a driver in this because it's going to get you that low power bus, super high connectivity. You know, you'll be able to do a lot of really interesting stuff there. Uh, the other thing that I've been reading a lot of is, and, and unrelated to my field, is in um, Wakefield Accelerators. Uh, which are the tabletop accelerators where you use a femto laser, you know, multi yeah. petawatt laser to accelerate bundles of electrons to like instead of using a one kilometer long linear accelerator, they can do it in a tabletop. Uh, so I've been reading a lot about this technology. The big problem there is staging two of these so that you get like five gig electron volt from one stage, five from the next. The output of that could be fed into a free electron laser to do like X-ray lasing or EUV lithography, as it were. So it's sort of related in the semiconductor space, but it's an area where I think like there's some breakthroughs in physics. Some people are going to win Nobel Prizes in 20 years. But like, you know, at the time, it's really hard to stay on top of what's like the, the advanced, most advanced thing in physics. And I would say that I'm really excited by like advanced light source stuff coming out with uh, these Wakefield accelerator lasers. Very cool. Thank you for your time. And we'll uh, put the uh, details to how to get a hold of a mirror uh, at the uh, end of this podcast. And uh, again, thank you for your time. You're very welcome. It's great doing this. All right. Have a good one. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Into the Forge. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to me via the email address podcast at lemnos.vc. We've got some great founder interviews coming in the next episodes. And for older episodes, please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or listen to episodes on the Lemnos VC website.